All right, so math 150, section one, lecture 15. What we're going to do today is we're going to do the proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus. How many of you have seen a proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus? Okay, how many of you are comfortable with the proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus? All right, not as many hands are going up on this one. You do not get the label fundamental lightly in mathematics. Right? There are not that many fundamental theorems. If it has such a label, you should know it. You should know why it's true. You haven't seen that many so far in life. You may have seen the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Every number can be written uniquely as a product of prime powers if you label the primes in increasing order. You might have seen the fundamental theorem of algebra. A polynomial of degree n has exactly n roots. The roots may be complex. There may be multiple roots. But there's exactly n roots to a polynomial of degree n. When you get to linear algebra, you might meet the fundamental theorem of linear algebra. I think it is overrated. I don't think it quite deserves the title fundamental, but whatever. In probability, there's the central limit theorem. It's not called fundamental, but you know, central should be enough to tell you how important it is. So before we prove the fundamental theorem of calculus, I want to just review a couple of techniques from Calc 1 that are extremely useful. And then the proof we're going to do today will generalize very nicely to what we do for several variables in terms of calculating volumes and more general objects. So I really want to focus on the tools and the techniques. So the first thing we need is the IVT. So what does IVT stand for? Intermediate value, Intermediate value theorem. And so it basically says if F is continuous and C is between F of A and f of b, then there exists a little c in the interval a, b, such that f of c equals big C. So another way of saying this is all intermediate values are assumed by a continuous function. There's no jumps. Right? If my function is discontinuous, this could be easily false. Have the function equal f of a for half the interval and f of b for the other half. So you really need continuity. So the question is, how rigorously do you want this proven? And so I will sketch a proof. And this might remind you of something we've seen before. So here's A, here's B. For convenience, I'll assume F of A is down here, and I'll assume F of B is up here. I can look and say, here is my value c. What value of c might we want to study? Zero. Could study c equals 0. You know, that's what we did before, but you know, it really doesn't matter what value we take. But does this remind you of something we've seen before? Where have we seen this already in the semester? So we did it before with the value 0. When was this? So this was divide and conquer, right? So if we now just have another value c over here, it's divide and conquer. Look at the midpoint here, a plus b over 2. You're either above c equal to c or below c. And what you can do is you can get a sequence of intervals. So the first interval will be your a0, b0, will be the interval a, b. Then you'll get the interval a1, b1. Maybe when I look over here, the value is here. So there must be something between a plus b over 2 and b. So that would be the interval a plus b over 2 and b. And then we could get the interval a2, b2, and so on. And what you would notice is a1 is less than equal to a2, is less than equal to dot, 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 is less equal to dot, 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 b2, less equal to b1, less equal to b0. So I would have a chain like this. And we get that an and bn both converge to some common value. What should we call that common value? And then what you'll see is 
by continuity, f of a n and f of b n are going to converge to f of c. And the only thing that that could equal is big C. So this is a pretty good sketch of the proof of the intermediate value thing. You know, I could make this a little bit more rigorous. What class would I take to make this a little bit more rigorous? Real analysis. Real analysis. So this is a plug for continuing to do real analysis so that I'm not drawing little arrows like this and dots. I'm just making things a bit more mathematical looking. I think for a Calc 3 class, this is a sufficient level of detail that you will be happy and not too bored or overwhelmed. Right. There's better uses of the time, but it is important to get a sense of what needs to be done to make it fully rigorous. Right. The next result is the MVT, most valuable theorem. Now, what does MVT stand for? Mean value theorem. Right. This is one of the big results in calculus. If f and f prime are continuous on, say, the closed interval a, b, then there exists a c in a, b, such that f of b minus f of a over b minus a is f prime of c, or equivalently, f of b minus f of a is f prime of c times b minus a, or equivalently, f of b equals f of a plus f prime of c times b minus a. So I've written it three different ways. So oh, it's a terrible horizontal line. Right. So here's my A, here's my B. That li the slope of the line connecting them is going to be your average speed. And then it's saying that there's some point in time where your instantaneous speed equals your average speed. Here is a proof by driving. Imagine your average speed is 50 miles per hour. Okay? So you start, so let's say average speed is 50 miles per hour. Could you always be driving less than 50 miles per hour? No, why not? then your average speed would be lower than 50. Could your average speed always be above 50 miles per hour? No. Prove it. Right. What am I really using to prove this? What theorem am I using to prove the mean value theorem? The intermediate value. The intermediate value theorem. There's probably a reason why I said it's not alphabetical order. I'm using IBT to prove MVT. Okay. And what I can do is I can say, well, let's look at my speed. Let's look at the first derivative at A. Let's look at the first derivative at b. If either one of them is the average, great, I'm done. If not, could they both be above? And you can play lots of different games like this. I think the word game like this is fine. Sometimes you do what's called Lowell's theorem, which is the special case where if you're told f of a and f of b are 0, then there's some point where the first derivative is 0. And then if you can prove this, you can actually prove this as a consequence. And if there's time at the end of the class, I'll show how Rolle's theorem leads to this. What's interesting is Rolle is remembered most for Rolle's theorem, but at the time, Rolle was actually a uh, person who was skeptical of some of the calculus claims. And originally, calculus was not on a firm foundation. What do we mean by these limits? What do we mean by these infinitesimal quantities? And there were legitimate concerns about how things were going. But are people comfortable with the mean value theorem? So I wrote it three different ways because different expressions are valuable at different times and you want to know how you want to write them. This is telling me my average speed is my instantaneous speed at some point. This is telling me my change is equal to my instantaneous speed at some special time times the elapsed amount of time. So if you want, you should think of this axis as time and you should think of this axis as distance. And then the derivative of distance versus time will be your speed. There's a nice geometric interpretation. There's a nice story we can tell. The last one over here is expanding my function. What is the value of f of b? Well, it's f of a, which is what I was when I started, plus a special speed times how much time has elapsed. 
When we get to Taylor series, we're not going to have f prime of c. We'll have f prime of a here. And then it's not going to necessarily be a perfect equality. It's much easier if you can evaluate it at the point A. When you look at the mean value theorem, when you look at the intermediate value theorem, what information would you love to know that the theorem is not giving you? So when you look at the statements, what would you love to know that's not being told? So these theorems are not as good as they could be. In an ideal world, I would have additional information from the mean value theorem. I would have additional information from the intermediate value theorem. What would you love to know in the intermediate value theorem? Yes? What C is? What C is? What would you like to know in the mean value theorem? Uh, what C is? What C is, right? We don't know what C is. We just know it exists. So I have a thesis student who is doing work on a game involving the Fibonacci numbers. And she was able to prove that you know, you, the way the game starts is you choose any positive integer. As long as you don't choose n equals 2, whoever goes second always has a winning strategy. It's an existence proof. We have no idea what the winning strategy is. There are several games like this where you can prove a certain person has a winning strategy without knowing what that winning strategy is. I will give you a quick example right now. This is the advantage of having you watch stuff at home. I can put in some additional supplementary material. We're going to play the dot game. So the way the dot game works is whoever goes last loses. And so I draw a bunch of dots on the board in a nice rectangular grid. And on your turn, you choose a dot. So you choose this one. And then you eat all the dots from this one up and from this one to the right. So if I choose this dot, how many dots will I eat? Six. If I choose this one, all. Since whoever goes last loses, you don't want to choose this on your first turn. So the question is, if I give you an n by m board, do you want to go first or second? And what's your winning strategy? So I will prove to you right now that whoever goes first has a winning strategy. This is a game, if you ever have to do math with little kids, this is a game you can play. All right, are you ready for the proof that whoever goes first has a winning strategy? Case one, player one has a winning strategy. Play it. You're comfortable with case one. What would case two be? Case one is player one has a winning strategy. What's case two? They don't. They don't. Right, so assume player one doesn't have a winning strategy. So let's say player one chooses that as their first move. Because they don't have a winning strategy, there must be a way for player two to win if player one goes there. Let's say the magic place for player two to go is here. If player one goes here, if player two goes there, player two wins. Okay? Let's turn back time. Where should player one have gone on their first turn? That's the magic point. Because now, when player one goes here, they eat up this one dot. When player two goes here, they eat up all those. And now player two has the winning strategy. It means whoever eats this dot has the winning strategy if the only part of the board eaten is this part. So all player one has to do now is just do that. And that contradicts the fact that player two has a winning strategy. I have just proven the existence of a winning strategy for player one without having any idea of where it is. Is this useful? I'd say it's a little bit useful. If you were to play this game, do you want to go first or second? I'd probably want to go first because I know at least player one has a winning strategy. But in terms of constructive, absolutely not. So there are a lot of times in mathematics where we have existence proofs but not constructive proofs. And the question is, when do you need something that's constructive? If you can construct it, that's terrific. But it is not always possible to give something that's constructive. The mean value theorem is not constructive, but fortunately for a lot of our applications, we don't need it to be. Just the existence of such a point is enough. And I really want to just emphasize the power of pure mathematics at times. I think I'm trying to use some lines uh, subliminally from watching Return of the Jedi with my kids this morning. All right. The proof I'm going to give of the fundamental theorem of calculus is not the most general proof. I am going to assume my functions are not just 
continuous, but also continuously differentiable. This makes the proof a little bit easier and avoids the infused results from real, from real analysis. So real analysis can remove the condition of f prime being continuous. So I want to talk briefly about what it means for a function to be bounded. So f is bounded by b on an interval a, b if for all x in a, b, we have the absolute value of f of x is less than or equal to b. There are times when you want to find the best bound possible. How many of you have ever ridden in an elevator? What information do they display on the elevator that might be relevant to a conversation on boundedness? Yes? How is that relevant to boundedness? I, I, I can see a possible argument. I mean, they will tell you basically where you could be. So they'll give you some information. Yes, what else? Maximum weight. All right. That's a really good example of boundedness. Do you think that this is the best bound on maximum weight? You know, they say maximum weight is 1,000 pounds. Do you think the maximum weight is exactly 1,000 pounds? What do you think it is? Probably a little bit over. They don't want to be that close. right? So in that case, they probably have not the optimal bound, but something a little bit lower just for some safety margins. Depending on what you're doing, you don't necessarily want to be just perfect so that anything above could cause issues. For us, however, we will only need the fact that a function is bounded. If we were to try to do numerical approximations to integrals, then the value of the bound would affect how good an approximation we have. So if we want to say approximate an integral to within 5%, then the value of the bound will tell us how long we need to go before we are sure we are within 5%. So for example, let's say f of x equals 3e to the 5x. Oh, we're not, we're not, I'm supposed to not use the number 5. e to the 4x plus cosine x to the 8 sine of x minus 11x cubed. And we'll say this is on the interval 0, 1. Do you think this function is bounded? The absolute value of a sum is going to be less than equal to the sum of the absolute values. What's the largest 3e e to the 4x could be? So this would be less than equal to 3e e to the 4. What's the largest cosine x to the 8 sine x could be? Yes. 1. Do you think it ever gets as high as 1? No, the only way it could get to 1 is if either cosine or sine was 1, and then the other one would have to be 0. If I put in a 1, am I overestimating? Absolutely. How would I find out what the true maximum value of cosine x to the 8 sine x is? What could I do? Take the derivative, find the critical points, and check the endpoints, right? Right? But if I put in a 1, that will be fine. What about the negative 11x cubed? What's the maximum that that could contribute? Zero. Zero, because x is on 0, 1. But if I wanted to just be really, really safe, put it in 11. When you add all this, does everybody agree e to the 4 is less than 10 to the 4? So this is less than a million. I am overestimating greatly. But I just need some bound. So it's really not a big deal to say a lot of our functions are bounded. Any function I give you like this is fine. If the first derivative is continuous, your function will be bounded. You can even check that by the mean value theorem. Um, well, so let, let's say if, if you know the first derivative is bounded, that will give you the function is bounded in terms of how much it can go. So there's lots and lots of ways you can show a function is bounded. In any of the functions we're looking at, boundedness is not going to be an issue. And 
and it allows us to bypass a technical result from real analysis. You can argue without using boundedness of the first derivative, but it just helps a lot. Okay, so these are all the preliminary pieces. Now we're going to prove the fundamental theorem of calculus. So, fundamental theorem of calculus. Let the integral from a to b of f of x dx denote the area under y equals f of x from a to b. Then, if big F prime equals little f, we have for f, f prime continuous and bounded that the area from a to b of f of x dx equals big F of b minus big F of a. So it's very important to make sure you understand what the fundamental theorem of calculus is saying. If you do not use the word area, it's wrong. We're not just saying the antiderivative at b minus antiderivative a is that notation. A huge part of the theorem is that this notation is area. Otherwise, it's almost a definition. And then we have the stated result that you know, if I have something like this, anything above the x-axis is counted as positive area. Anything below is counted as negative area. So it's a signed quantity. One of the reasons we care so much about results like this is probability. It is frequently areas denote probabilities of events. And when we have the baseball lecture in April, when the perspectives are visiting, I will talk about how we can use results like this for a variety of problems in baseball in terms of calculating the chance that something happens. Right, what else? So I say if big F prime equals little f, this is actually really good notation. You know, my function is little f, my antiderivative, my integral, I want something that's related to f that I can quickly look at, so let's use a capital F. Is there a unique antiderivative? No. How do all the antiderivatives differ? By some arbitrary constant c. So at this time, at the end of the day, we can show that if you have two antiderivatives that have the same derivative, then they differ by a constant. Well, if you look at what happens, the only thing that survives at the end is big F of B minus big F of A. So if I increase F by 5 here, I also increase this by 5, and so there's no change in the difference. So we can use any antiderivative. This goes back to when we were dropping the chalk and doing the change in potential becomes kinetic energy. All that matters is the change in potential. It doesn't matter where do we start counting potential energy from. It just matters how much things have changed. Okay. Any other questions about the statement of the result? Okay. So now, let's do the proof. So we've got about 25 minutes to do the proof. Right, that should hopefully be enough. So without loss of generality, I'm going to assume a equals 0 and b equals 1. I'm going to just look at a function on the unit interval. It is important that for what we're doing, we're always looking at finite intervals. Right? If the interval is infinite, you have to do a little bit more work. You might have heard the phrase indefinite integral in one of your earlier calculus classes, and you just have to be careful. Any time an infinity emerges, you have to be careful. Let's just use 0 and 1 to make the notation a little bit nicer. What I will do is here's 0, here's 1, here's 1 over n, 2 over n, k over n, k plus 1 over n, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll call this point xk and this point xk plus 1. So we're chopping the interval up into n equally sized portions. And we're going to look at what's happening on each one. And this is where we're going to get our upper sums and our lower sums. So I've got you know, some function. And so let's zoom in. Here's xk. Here's xk plus 1. Okay. 
and I want to calculate the area under the curve, or I want to estimate it. The hope is the more cuts I make, the better job it will do. And so what we're going to do is we're going to choose a couple of special points. This point over here, LK, is going to be where my function is smallest. And this point over here, UK, will be where my function is largest. Now we are slightly using the result from real analysis, that on a closed interval, a continuous function attains its maximum and minimum values. Does it seem reasonable that I should be attaining my maximum and minimum values? If not, what you could do is imagine a sequence of points where each point is less than the previous. And you keep applying F. And you'll have a sequence of points. And you can choose a subsequence from that. And it's going to have to converge to something. And it'll converge to something in the interval. It can't leave the interval. And so if there's time at the end of the day, I will show that you really do attain your minimum and your maximum. This is very different than if we had an open interval. If we had an open interval and we don't have the endpoints, then maybe there is no maximum in my interval. Maybe I'm just getting larger and larger and larger as I get towards the end. So it's very important that we have closed intervals. So what we can do is we can get our lower sum and our upper sum. And then the true area is going to live between them. All right, so we would get that f of, f of lk. Now, what's the length of this interval? 1 over, One over n. Is this equal to the area sub, or the area sub k? is this equal to f of uk times 1 over n. And so the true area has to be sandwiched in between. And now what I'll do is I'll just sum over all my intervals. So we'll get the sum. k goes from uh, we have to decide how we want to define things. Uh, so it'll go from 0 to n minus 1, because my first interval will go from x0 to 1 over n. So f lk 1 over n is less than equal to area, is less than equal to the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of f uk 1 over n. So we'll call this the lower sum L, and we'll call this the upper sum U. And we know, now here's something that's interesting. As I increase N, do my lower sums always either stay the same or go up, and do my upper sums always stay the same or go down? Do I only do better? Unfortunately, not necessarily. Because if I add just one more point, I then have to reshift all of these points over here. And on now all of a sudden, maybe a really good point is no longer available. If you want to make sure that the lower sums are never getting worse and the upper sums are never getting better, what you do is you do what's called a refinement. So if I first do 0, 1, I would then do 1 point in the middle. I would have now just the point 1 half. Then the next one is I would do 1 quarter and 3 quarters. And the next one I would add the eighths, then add the sixteenths, and add the thirty seconds. And if I do it like that, then the lower sums will never go down, and the upper sums will never go up. We don't need to worry about that. I'm just trying to show you various concerns. So what we want to do is we want to see, do the upper sums and the lower sums converge to a common value? If they converge to a common value, what's the only value that UN and LN could converge to if they converge to the same thing? The area. The area lives between them. So we want to show the limit as n goes to infinity of un minus ln equals 0. Because if we can do that, we now have the area. Right? Is it possible that the upper sum minus the lower sum could be negative? Could the upper sum 
being less than the lowest one. No, we're choosing the opposite from the points where the function is largest. So we know it's a, it can't be negative. We now just need to show it's not positive. So prove the upper sum minus the lower sum is going to be the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of f u k minus f l k times 1 over n. What's the first thing I should do to try to understand the sum? Good, so we move out the 1 over n. We've got a sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of f u k, and I'm being very careful how I say this, minus f l k. This is looking really good. I have a 1 over n outside. As n goes to infinity, that's going to go to 0. So does that mean this whole sum becomes small? What do you think? I've got the 1 over n outside, n is going to infinity. So is that enough to then deduce that this whole thing becomes small? Why or why not? Yes? I mean, like, in terms, like, f or, like, the upper sum can be big, but then like, equal the lower sum. Well, what I'm saying, I'm dividing that whole yeah. sum by n, and n goes to infinity. Yes? Okay, so do you think the sum could grow? I mean, shouldn't f of uk minus f of lk be small? How many terms do I have in the sum? Infinity. I'm sorry? Infinity. Not infinity. How many terms are in the sum? Zero. No. This, this whole sum, the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1. How many terms are there in the sum? How many values of k am I adding together? N. N. I'm adding n terms and I'm dividing by n. So even though this 1 over n is going to 0, I have n terms. And the number of terms is going to infinity. So I have two competing forces. And there are some strange functions. I could give you, you know, f of x equals 1 if x is a rational number, and 0 if x is not rational. This function is not continuous. But if you look at the upper sums, the upper sums will always be 1. Because in any interval, you'll always have a rational number. The lower sums will always be 0. In every interval, you always have an irrational number. So this difference would always be 1. And the upper sum and the lower sum would not converge. Right? So somehow, we need to use continuity. Somehow, we need to use boundedness. That's why I want to just mention this. There's a reason we have assumptions. You have assumptions essentially for two reasons. It's false without it, or it makes the proof much easier. So we need to show that this is getting small. What do you think we might use to analyze f of uk minus f of lk? So what might help us? Yes? The mean value of him. So I think I might have warned you earlier in the semester that this lecture, similar to the TV show Friends, could be titled The One with the Mean Value of Him. How many of you have seen Friends? I think there are only two episodes that do not begin their title with the one with. There's at most two. I think it's the pilot and maybe the final episode. Right. But when in doubt in today's lecture, mean value theorem. So by the mean value theorem, this is 1 over n, the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1, f prime of ck times uk minus lk. How big could uk minus lk be? What's the maximum distance it could be from uk to lk? 1 over n. They both live in the interval xk to xk plus 1. So the maximum distance between uk and lk is 1 over n. It's possible that lk comes after uk. So it's possible that uk minus lk could be negative, in which case the first derivative might be negative. So I, want, I have to be a little bit careful with signs. Not, not a big deal. So I'll put in absolute values. And so I'll get the absolute value of un minus ln is less equal to 1 over n. The sum k goes from 0 to n. Now I have a 1 over n from this. I have f prime 
of C K. And again, I don't know where those points C K are. I just know that those points exist. Now we use the fact that the first derivative is bounded. So there is some B such that these are all bounded by B. And so over here, this was by mean value theorem. And now by boundedness, it's going to be less equal to, I can pull out the 1 over n. And now we have a 1 over n squared, a sum k goes from 0 to, oh, it should be n minus 1, of big B. All right, what's the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of big B? So what would that sum be? Uh, big B times n. Big B times n. I have big B n times. So this is just 1 over n squared and b, and you get b over n, which goes to 0. And now we win. What's wonderful is we don't need to know where those points are. What's wonderful is we don't need to know where that value b is. We just need to know the points exist. We just need to know the bound exists. Once we have that, then we show that in the limit we get 0. Great. At the end of the day, how many of you have ever calculated approximations to areas by doing partitions? All right. How many of you continue to do that? Or now that you know calculus, you just use the antiderivative. Right? We're going to just use the infinite result. We don't need these intermediate steps. It's absolutely fine to just be at this level. So we're now halfway there. Okay. We've shown that these converge to the area. So we've shown that the upper sums and the lower sums converge to the area. It's the only thing that they can be. All we have to do now is show that the upper sums and the lower sums are also the antiderivative at b minus the antiderivative at a. And then we're done. Right. Any questions on what's left? So all we have to do now is show that the upper and the lower sums, or just one of them, converges to the antiderivative. All right. So there's a couple of ways of doing the calculation. So must show that un converges to the integral from 0 to 1, I'm sorry, converges to f of b minus f of a. Well, what's interesting is the following. We have the lowest sum, the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of f of lk times 1 over n, less than equal to the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1 f of, uh, I'll do yk times 1 over n, less than equal to the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1 f of uk, 1 over n, where yk is just any point in the interval. yk is anything in xk, xk plus 1. And the reason is, if I take any point, then the value of the function there can't be smaller than f of lk. So this sum has to be at least as large as the lower bound. And it can't be larger than f of uk, so it's going to be less equal to the upper sum. So here is another way to calculate the area under the curve. Choose any sequence of points you want and take a finer and finer partition. No matter what sequence of points you choose, it will work. Some points will work better than others. Some points will converge faster than others. But any sequence of points work. Okay? So we have freedom to choose the y case. So we, we need to choose yk's. Do you know any theorem where you have some arbitrary points yk that might be useful to use right now? Any theorem that might be useful? Mean value theorem. Right. When in doubt, guess the mean value theorem today. What function should we apply the mean value theorem to? Only two functions, well, there's three functions under consideration. We're getting f 
of yk. So if we wanted to use the mean value theorem with the arbitrary points, if we're evaluating the arbitrary point at little f, what do you think we apply the mean value theorem to? What, th what function? Big F. Excellent. So choose yk such that big F of xk plus 1 minus big F of xk is big F prime of yk times xk plus 1 minus xk. Well, when we simplify the algebra, we get big F of xk plus 1 minus big F of xk is equal to little f of yk times 1 over m. And now we just sum. So if we sum, we'll get the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of f of yk of 1 over m. And now over here, we get a sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of f of xk plus 1 minus f of xk. All right. So I want you to calculate the following sum for me. Let's see. 5 minus 1 plus 7 minus 5 plus 99 minus 7 plus 1701 minus 99 plus 24601 minus 1701. What is this equal? Quickly, 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 quickly. I need to know now, 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 now. Uh, 24600. How did you get that so quickly? Were you doing it as uh, you went along? So this is a telescoping sum. All that matters is the last term minus the first term. Everything else cancels. We have a telescoping sum here. If you expand this out, what do we have? We have f of x1 minus f of x0 plus f of x2 minus f of x1 dot 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 plus f of xn minus f of xn minus 1. And so everything cancels, and you're left with f of xn, which is f of 1, minus f of 0. So what we see is this amazing result that if we choose the yk's by the mean value theorem, this is just f of 1 minus f of 0. This doesn't change. So this number is between the low and the upper sum. And as long as we choose those special points, it's always going to be f of 1 minus f of 0. What does f of 1 minus f of 0 then have to be? What's the only thing f of 1? Yes. It has to be the area. There's nothing else it can be. It's always at least as large as the lower sum. It's never greater than the upper sum. So we know that ln is less than equal to f1 minus f0 is less than equal to un. un converges to the area. ln converges to the area. So the only thing that this can converge to, well, actually, it has to, it has to always be the area. And this proves the fundamental theorem of calculus. So in less than one class, we have proven the fundamental theorem of calculus. We needed to use the boundedness to show that the upper and the lower sums converged. That was the only place we really needed the boundedness of the first derivative. You can just get this by continuity of the function by using results from real analysis. Okay. So monumental result. It gives us a way to compute areas. Now, unfortunately, the way is to use this function called the antiderivative. It's of great use when you can actually write down explicitly what the antiderivative is. There are a lot of functions that don't have a nice antiderivative. So I've told you, the big lie of Calc 2 is that you can integrate. You can't, I can't, no one can. Right? Integration is hard. Differentiation is easy. You know, I hope this doesn't make you feel bad. Differentiation is trained monkey work. You know, you've got a couple of rules. Derivative e to the x is e to the x. Derivative of sine is cosine. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. Derivative of log is 1 over x. You memorize those things. 
you've got a couple of rules on how to split complicated things into simple things. I got a product, I use the product rule, and I just use each piece. I have a composition, I use the chain rule. Differentiation is trivial in some sense in that you can reduce it to a bunch of simple steps which you've learned. Integration is much, much harder. There are tricks you can sometimes do to find antiderivatives, but in general it's very, very hard. It gets worse when you get to several variables. And so it's a lot of work to get something that we can integrate in closed form, but it's very valuable if you can do so. All right, so we've got about five minutes left. So this is a chance to talk about a few additional things. Let me just briefly talk about how you can get the mean value of the from Wohl's theorem. And it illustrates a really good concept in mathematics. It's often easier to first prove a simple case and then show how the general case follows from the simple case. So Wohl is, you know, if we're in a situation like this, there's always some point C where that happens. Let's consider, you know, the general case. So here's A, here's B, here's my function f of x. Okay? I'm going to form a new function. Let's let g of x be f of x minus f of a. When x equals a, what do we get? Zero. Zero. So that's beginning to look a lot like Wolf's theorem. When x equals b, what do we get? We get f of b minus f of a. So it's not quite Wolf's theorem. So I want to subtract off f of b minus f of a. But if I just subtract this off, it's now screwed it up when x equals a. So I want to multiply this by something that will be good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this by x minus a over b minus a. When x equals a, what does this term equal? Zero. When x equals b, now we get b minus a, which is one. So notice now, g of a equals g of b equals zero. We can use Wohl's theorem. So by Wohl, there exists a C such that G prime of C equals zero. Well, what is G prime of C? That means F prime of X, right? This is G prime of X. It'll be F prime of X, that's a constant, minus F of B minus F of A over B minus A, and what's the derivative of x minus a? 1. So this equals g prime of x. So if we take the special value of c that Wohl's tells us, we get f prime of c minus this equals 0. Ah, so we get f prime of c is f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So we've now reduced the mean value of the intervals there. And what we did is essentially almost like linear algebra, just like that, lean over. You want to basically draw your axes like this. That's essentially what we're doing. So this is a great concept in math, reduced to something simple. Right. So now all we need to do is quickly prove Wohl's theorem. We've got about a minute. That should be enough time. So here's Wohl's theorem. So Wohl So we know we're zero at these places. Without loss of generality, and I'm going to do this really fast, we know that my, let's assume the first derivative is not zero at either of these points. If it was zero at one of those points, we're done. We've already found a place where the first derivative is zero. Let's assume the first derivative is positive here. So my function's increasing. If the first derivative is negative here, then we know that the function is decreasing. And so there has to be some intermediate point where we have a max and we're done. So what if we had something that was positive here? Then my function is increasing. And that would mean at some point my function had to be negative. Right? If my function is increasing, the only way it can become negative is there would have to be some point where my first derivative became negative. 
And now I'm back to the previous case where first order was positive at one point, negative at another, so by the intermediate value theorem. So you can get Wollstone without too much trouble, and from Wall, you can get mean value. All right, good place to stop.